Hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's good to be with you on this Wednesday, March 9th. And here is some of what we're talking about tonight. Ukraine says Russian attacks hit a children's hospital and a maternity ward. Meanwhile, Vice President Kamala Harris is in Poland visiting a NATO ally. Her agenda will surely include Poland's unexpected offer to send the Ukrainians fighter jets, an offer the Biden administration rejected. The Polish ambassador to the U.S. joins us live. We'll also hear from a member of Ukraine's parliament. She says she's disappointed with President Biden's responses so far. So what would she like to see change? Also, a young soccer star documented his escape from Ukraine just as the Russians started attacking. And... A moment of beauty in the ugliness of war. Russia's assault on key Ukrainian cities is apparently getting even more ruthless. Today, Ukraine blamed Russian airstrikes for destroying a children's hospital in the southern city of Mariupol. Ukrainian officials released videos of the devastation. Again, this comes from the Ukrainians. They say 17 people have been hurt, including staff and mothers in the maternity ward. No word so far of injured children or of deaths. Mariupol has been under intense shelling for days now. Ukrainian authorities are trying to establish humanitarian corridors with Russia to evacuate civilians, but Russian attacks have apparently frustrated those efforts. Ukraine is also raising new concerns about the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Officials say damage by Russian forces disconnected the plant from the electric grid. Now, nuclear plants need outside energy to fuel key systems, including cooling. Tonight, the site of the world's worst nuclear disaster is being powered by diesel generators. The International Atomic Energy Agency says the plant is not, not in immediate danger, at least not right now. And all of this is taking place as President Volodymyr Zelensky pleads for additional fighter jets. That is something the U.S. seems unlikely to provide. More on that in a minute. Meanwhile, the foreign ministers of Ukraine and Russia plan to meet tomorrow for the first time since this war began. So far, the war has forced more than two million Ukrainians from their homes. And that is why we begin with NBC's Ellison Barber, who joins us from Poland. Ellison, what's the latest you can tell us about the effort to receive refugees from Ukraine? Hey, Joshua, so we have been to six different border crossings, six different refugee welcome centers, makeshift refugee camps in the last 12 days. And we have seen time and time again just this massive influx of people, predominantly women and children, crossing the border. Of those two million plus people who have fled Ukraine, about 1.3 million have come here to Poland. We have seen them come piled in buses, in personal vehicles, and often on foot. We are hearing story after story of survival, but also devastation. When people arrive in Poland, there's almost this quick moment of relief, of this feeling, this comfort, knowing that they are safe here. But then there is this immediate need to act, to figure out step by step what happens next. When we first started reporting on this about 12 days ago, we were meeting a lot of people who were coming to Poland because they had family or friends in the country. Now we're meeting a lot of people who do not know anyone here. So when they get to the border crossing, they're asking around, trying to figure out where they can sleep, where they can stay for the night, and then figure out more of a long-term plan. We spoke today to a 16-year-old who helped her mother evacuate their town in eastern Ukraine, Kharkiv, and also get her other three siblings to safety. She described what it was like. Listen to what she told us. It was really difficult to escape when we were getting on the train. Everybody was pushing each other. The little children are falling down. It's, it's so scary. Yeah, everybody's panicking. It's, it was so hard. And they start shooting. 
So altogether, this is terrible. What do you want other teens in the U.S., anyone watching this, to understand about what you're going through and what you want for your future? What do you want for your future? I want them to know that we need to value what we have and we need to value what we have and not to complain about something you don't have. What do you want for your future? 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 What do you want for your other places, more north, smaller border crossings, where it's really just a volunteer-led effort and sort of makeshift groups. At times, we'll see people standing, holding signs with the names of cities in Poland, offering rides, saying, we have two seats in this car. And that's really how people are trying to navigate where they go from once they cross into Poland. Joshua? I just want to highlight, Ellison, something that that teenager said in the transcript in case it was hard to hear when you asked what you want other teens in the U.S. to understand. She said, I want them to know that we need to value what we do have and not complain about what we don't have. Wise words from a teenager who's been through a lot. Ellison, before I got to let you go, how is the Polish government dealing with this? We'll speak to a Polish ambassador in just a second for their official view, but just a quick Google map search. I drew a line from Kharkiv due west to the Polish border. That's about 560 miles to run for your life. How is Poland doing receiving this influx of people so far? You know, it's an incredibly challenging situation, and we've seen moments, days where it looks like things all things considered are going well, other moments where it looks like it's really not. And things have started to seem, in, in just from where we are on the ground, more organized as the days have passed. But one thing to keep in mind, uh, transportation, that continues to be a big issue. And you've had mayors of Polish border towns talk about how it is difficult to get enough buses, enough cars to transport this very large group of refugees coming to other places further in where they can have a place to sleep overnight. It's cold. People can't just be out sleeping. It's not safe. And so they're working through that. But they're obviously, understandably, I think at a lot of times, there are big hiccups. You have to remember here, the UN said in the first seven days since Russia uh, launched their invasion on February 24th, a million people fled Ukraine. If you go back and look at other humanitarian refugee crises, you look at Syria, fighting there began in 2011. It was 2013 when the UN said a million people had fled Syria. You look at Venezuela, back in 2014, the UN was talking about how a million people had fled the country in a seven-month period, and that was a lot. So we saw here a million people, most of them coming to Poland, fleeing in just the first seven days. We're at day 13 now, and it's over two million. So the exodus of people here really is unprecedented in modern times. And you do have a situation here where you had neighboring countries opening their doors, welcoming in refugees. And unfortunately, that's not something we saw happen uh, with Syria or arguably even Venezuela. And we have to have discussions as to why that was the case. But in terms of how the Polish government is handling this, it is really an unprecedented amount of people coming and all things considered. They seem to have a pretty effective plan moving forward, but there obviously are holes. And it is happening so fast that I think when you talk to refugees, they often seem to understand some of that because they know that this is a lot for everyone in a very short period of time. Joshua. Yeah, I hear that. I hear that. Thank you, Ellison. Please stay safe as best you can. That's NBC's Ellison Barber starting us off tonight. Let's continue with Poland and its response to all of this because Vice President Kamala Harris is in Poland tonight with some big items on her agenda. Those include something the administration apparently did not expect. One thing we suspect she'll be speaking with Polish leaders about is their offer to transfer fighter jets to Ukraine. Today, Pentagon spokesperson John Kirby all but ruled that out. He called it a high-risk move that would make matters worse. The intelligence community has assessed that the transfer of MiG-29s to Ukraine may be mistaken as escalatory and could result in a significant Russian reaction that might increase the prospects of a military escalation with NATO. Now, Poland had offered to give Soviet-era fighter jets, MiGs, 
to Ukraine via a U.S. airbase in Germany. But Germany says they're not keen on this idea either. An official said the Polish proposal is, quote, not currently on the table, unquote. Ukraine's President Zelensky is clearly desperate for a decision. Послухайте, у нас війна, у нас немає часу на ці медіа, на всі ці сигнали. Це ж не пінг-понг, це про людське життя. Ми ще раз просимо, вирішуйте це швидше. Не перекидайте відповідальність, відправте нам літаки. Meanwhile, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin spoke to his Polish counterpart today. The fighter jets were apparently not a topic of discussion, but they did talk about the American troops who are deployed in and around Poland right now to support NATO allies. Currently, about 4,700 U.S. troops are stationed in Poland. Joining us now from Washington is Poland's ambassador to the United States, Marek Magierowski. Ambassador Magierowski, welcome to the program. Good to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Can I begin with just the situation on the border with refugees from Ukraine? What are the conversations happening right now between the Polish government and the United States government about how that's, go how that's going and whether any more support is needed there? This is definitely, as you rightly noted, uh, an unprecedented situation. We have absorbed more than a million and, a three and 300,000 uh, refugees from Ukraine in uh, such a short period of time. Uh, last week, I said in one of the interviews I gave that uh, it is um, probably the first time in Europe's history in which uh, the host country doesn't need to build refugee camps. Uh, but of course, that can change because Poland is now filling up. So I'm afraid we are going to reach a, criti a critical point uh, pretty shortly. So we need to deepen our cooperation in this respect, absorbing further waves of migrants and of refugees from Ukraine in a joint effort within the European Union, but also in uh, cooperation with the United States. What do you think that deepening cooperation needs to look like? Is Poland going to be going to the EU or to the United Nations to ask neighboring countries to help receive this outflow? What, what, what might that look like? We are ready to admit even more uh, refugees from Ukraine. Uh, there was an, a remarkable outpouring of uh, solidarity and sympathy among uh, Poles, uh, all those people have been admitted into Polish homes, into boarding houses, student dormitories. Uh, but of course, as I said, uh, this is a huge challenge and an uphill struggle, both for ordinary citizens, thousands of volunteers. Uh, I'm so grateful for their work. And also the, 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 the government, the local authorities. Uh, and that's why, for example, I have been talking uh, over the last couple of days with mayors of American cities, with governors, with lawmakers about a possibility of relocating some of those refugees. Again, I would like to stress very clearly that it should be a common effort. Uh, there is uh, uh, that uh, common perception that we should, the free world should help the Ukrainians defend themselves against this uh, uh, unprovoked, unjustified and brutal invasion of the Russian forces in their own homeland. But I think that uh, that uh, assistance and uh, humanitarian, dealing with the humanitarian crisis should also be a common endeavor. So just before I move on from this, is it the Polish government's hope that these refugees will move on beyond, say, the immediate uh, areas of like, you know, Berlin and Prague moving out from Poland even farther into the United States, that there be a larger worldwide reception? Or do you expect most of the refugees to stay a little closer to Ukraine so that hopefully they can go back home quickly? We've been, so far, we've been doing uh, remarkably well uh, dealing with this humanitarian crisis. But of course, uh, there are many more challenges ahead. And um, I believe nobody knows because it's absolutely unpredictable uh, where we are all heading and when this war eventually will eventually end. So we expect uh, not hundreds of thousands of new refugees, but uh, uh, millions. So. Uh, as I said, it was, and it is, our moral obligation to admit all those refugees from Ukraine. Many people are saying that uh, Poland is doing right now for Ukraine what uh, many other nations did not do for Poland in 1939. This is a very uh, distant uh, historical parallel, but I think uh, at least those people who claim that are partially right. So uh, we are doing it uh, with the conviction that we should help the Ukrainians, because we, if we don't help them, and we, if we don't stop Mr. Putin in his uh, uh, murderous intentions, uh, that could have very nasty 
and long-term consequences for the entire free world. Let me dig into something you just said, Ambassador, by way of shifting to another topic in terms of Poland doing for Ukrainians what the world did not do for Poland in 1939 when Hitler was making his way across Europe. With regards to these MiG fighter jets that Poland offered to transfer to the Ukrainians through Rammstein Air Force Base in Germany, that's gotten pushback from the U.S. government, from the German government. But based on what you just said, I wonder if that illuminates part of the rationale as to why Poland wanted to offer these jets as a way to take quick action against an intense military offensive by Russia and do as much as possible to stop this rather than just kind of receive the migrant outflow. Could, could you just talk a little bit more about the motivation yeah, all, behind Poland's offer? First and foremost, Joshua, I would like to remind you that uh, at the very beginning of this debate about the Soviet-made uh, fighter jets which were supposed to be delivered to Ukraine, uh, we made it abundantly clear that we could not deplete our arsenal of combat aircraft by one third without any backup or compensation. And uh, the Polish president, as well as the Polish prime minister, have been very adamant and have reiterated on multiple occasions that uh, uh, we would not transfer these airplanes to Ukraine directly, and we would certainly not make uh, such a decision uh, unilaterally. So uh, then it turned out that, of course, we were under immense pressure, tremendous pressure, on the part of uh, our allies, the public opinion, also here in the United States. So we decided to come up with a logical and conscionable solution to put those aircraft at the disposal of the U.S. government and to transfer them to an air base uh, in uh, Germany. Uh, we were also acutely aware of the technical, uh, logistical and diplomatic consequences of uh, such a move and also of the military, of the potential military fallout. We realized very well how risky such a move would be. And that's why we came up with a different uh, solution. The proposed plan has been rejected by our American partners. Uh, we understand their position. Nevertheless, I would, I would like to stress, this, stress it very clearly. Uh, I believe that we will continue coordinating our efforts, both bilaterally and within NATO, with other NATO member states, in order to help the Ukrainians as effectively as possible uh, to defend themselves uh, in terms of our military assistance. So I think we can now move on and think about other means of uh, uh, aiding uh, the Ukrainian society and the Ukrainian army. Any reflections on how this idea was floated? It seemed to catch the US and Germany rather by surprise. Well, generally there was, a, uh, as I said, we were opposed to the idea from the very beginning, but uh, that immense pressure which mounted um, for days after the beginning of the hostilities just forced us to come up with uh, another solution. And again, I think this is uh, what we should do now is to emphasize again the unity and the cohesion of NATO and of the free world, if you will, uh, because uh, this is our a rivalry, a fight against pure evil. And we have to realize that, that we have to join our efforts and to work together, shoulder to shoulder, within the framework of international cooperation and without engaging in um, a direct military confrontation with Russia in order to defeat Mr. Putin, in order for the Ukrainians to prevail in this war. Two more quick questions, Ambassador, before I have to let you go. I want to make sure I heard what you just said clearly. It sounded like you said that Poland was initially opposed to this idea of sending Russian MiGs to Ukraine, but public pressure led the Polish government to float the idea, but that that was not yeah. Poland's first choice. Did I hear you correctly? Yes, yes, that's correct. Okay, and the other thing I did want to ask is about what the next steps might be that Poland might uh, advocate. Your energy minister said in an interview with Politico this past week that the EU needs to de its energy sector. I know Poland is going to begin getting some of its energy in a new Baltic pipe from Norway rather than from Gazprom, yeah. which is the Russian national uh, energy utility. What would be next on Poland's list in terms of the steps that NATO, the EU, should consider to not have more of a military posture in this, but to do the next strongest move in trying to prevent speaking, this yeah, war from escalating speaking of, further. Speaking of energy security, we made a very bold move 
and we took a very wise decision many years ago to make Poland independent on imports of Russian gas. And that's why, uh, as you said, we are completing the construction of the Baltic pipeline. Our long-term contract with uh, the Gazprom company expires this year, and we will be completely independent on imports of Russian gas as of this year, unlike some other European uh, countries. So it, we insist, and I think this, this would be uh, a breakthrough moment for Europe if we finally decide to uh, make Europe, not only Poland, independent on uh, imports of uh, Russian uh, commodities and uh, raw materials. Long-term deterrence is another priority. I believe we need more American uh, military presence on Polish soil, but also in the Baltics, in Romania, in other countries on the eastern flank. Uh, Long-term deterrence, because we are going to live with Mr. Putin for many years to come, I'm afraid, and that's why we need to be very precise. Uh, speaking of uh, the real threat Mr. Putin and contemporary Russia poses to us, not only to the eastern flank, but to uh, to whole Europe. And that's why I believe that uh, uh, the political elites, both in Europe and in the United States, have already understood uh, to what extent we should, uh, we should brace ourselves for next steps Mr. Putin might undertake in the future. On another night, Ambassador, I would love to talk to you further about that last comment, about the U.S. military presence in NATO states, including Poland, and what that might mean for the future. But for now, Marek Magyarowski is Poland's ambassador much. to the United States. I appreciate you coming on, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Still to come, Ukrainian President Zelensky spoke to Sky News about where things stand now. We will show you what he said. Plus, what is it like leaving Ukraine to escape this war? You'll see how a soccer player documented his journey online. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. They want us to feel like animals. That is what Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said today after Russian missiles struck a children's hospital and a maternity ward. President Zelensky spoke to our partners at Sky News. Your special correspondent, Alex Crawford. They want us to feel like animals because they blocked our cities, the biggest cities in Ukraine, and uh, they blocked and and uh, because they don't want our our people to get some food, water. Yesterday, for example, children. I don't know if you, if you know the children in Mariupol was uh, the child uh, was dead. Mm. Yes, you know that, that that is the idea of of this operation, or or I don't know how, how is Putin is telling about it. So that is the idea to Ukraine to, Ukra to do with Ukrainian animals, but, but but we are not. So how do you stop it? Are you going? Are you prepared we to would. do a deal? You've said you're happy to talk. We can't stop alone all this. Mm -hmm. No, How it's, 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 it's it going to only be? if uh, the world will unite around Ukraine. Around they are uniting around Ukraine. They are not. They are still. It, it's still very slowly. It's still very slowly. But you can feel it only when you are here, because the people from Europe or USA, it's, it's far from Ukraine. It's far from the heart of this tragedy, and and you you can't see, you, you you can't understand the details because you are not fighting here. And I understand why. And I don't want them to fight. But these countries can help. Can unite because. We can't speak about the close. The, I'm sorry that I'm speaking again and again about this problem, but we spoke about uh, children, ho hospitals, etc. And you know the, 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 the number of these child deaths. And, uh, and, and, uh, and so we are speaking about closing the sky. You can't decide to close or not to close. You can't decide. If you are united against the Nazism and this terror, you have to close. Not me. Don't wait me asking you several times, a lot, million times, close the sky. No, you have to phone us to our people who lost their children and say, sorry, we didn't do it yesterday, one week ago. We didn't push Putin. We didn't speak with him a lot. We didn't found, find the dialogue with him. We, 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 we did nothing. And it's true. Yesterday, 
the world did nothing. I'm sorry, but it's true. Boris Johnson, yeah. the British Prime Minister, as a number of other le world leaders, say if they do that, if they close the sky, that is, that could exacerbate and make the situation even worse. If they provide, if they allow Poland to provide you jets on and station it on NATO land, that will make it worse. Uh, what would you say? What, to what, them? what does it mean worse? For whom? Mm -hmm. So the first question is rhetoric, and. I, we, we don't need rhetoric questions and answers. We have to have contradictory things. So it would be was for whom? For our families? No. For whom? For them? Uh, no. Who knows? Nobody knows. Uh, but, but we know exactly that now is very bad. And in future it will be too late. And believe me, Believe me, if, it, if it's prolonged uh, this way, yes, you will see, they will close the sky, but will lose millions of people. That's Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky speaking to Sky News special correspondent Alex Crawford. Let's continue now with Oleksandra Ustinova, a member of the Ukrainian parliament. Ms. Ustinova, welcome to the program. Thank you. Could I first get just your reactions to what we heard from President Zelensky in that uh, interview? Well, I think every person in Ukraine, and to be honest, every child in Ukraine knows what the no-fly zone is. And people and children keep uh, drawing that airplanes and keep drawing the Ukrainian flags, asking for the no-fly zone because they see it on TV. They see it right there in their uh, neighbor, uh, neighborhoods, bombs and shells coming from the sky. And they understand that the only escape, the only salvation for them for the moment is the no-fly zone that only the uh, international community can provide, the United States, NATO, or any other country. Unfortunately, what my president Zelensky is saying is true. One day it's going to happen because when you, we already have thousands of civilians dead, shelled to death, bombed to death, shot to death. And it's just a matter of time when the uh, leaders of the European countries, of NATO, of the United States, are going to step in because, to be honest, 25 years ago when we gave up our nuclear weapons, we've been promised that if anything happens to the Ukrainian independence or sovereignty, we would have the protection. Now we hear that we're not a NATO uh, country, and if something happens to the NATO country, then the West will step in. Well, we've already heard this promise. 25 years ago, unfortunately, this promise is not kept. And we understand this is just a matter of how many lives. And I keep asking every time when somebody says, well, that's going to be an escalation with Putin. Putin does not need right. an escalation. He can, if he decides to go into war with NATO, United States, or any European country, he is going to do that. My only question to our Western partners is, where is the red line? Tell us the number of people or the number of children that have to die, women that have to die, or raped before they step in and stop this genocide, this execution well, that we keep watching. I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm clear on, on the stakes that you're talking about. I hear you in terms of what's happening on the ground and on Ukraine's security situation after it gave up its nuclear weapons years ago. What you are asking for is literally for Americans to open up the possibility that America and Russia could end up in a shooting war with one another, that we might end up sending our sons and daughters to die in Ukraine for the sake of stopping the war there. I want you to just talk to the American people directly and explain why that's a sacrifice we should consider making. First of all, I'm not asking the American soldiers to put the boots here on the ground and fight for us. We had already proved as a nation we can do it on our own. The well, only but if, thing the, if the NATO countries get involved in this and if this becomes a matter of shooting between Russia and NATO countries, the U.S. is coming. That's the rule of the NATO charter. An attack on one is an attack on all, so it could end up being that. If not boots on the ground, it could be planes in the air, it could be ships in the sea coming into the Sea of Azog or the Black Sea or trying to close off the Dnieper River. I mean, who knows which way it could turn out, and then it could be American lives at risk. So let's 
let's put it honestly. First of all, 25 years ago, when we gave up our nuclear weapons, that was a promise from the United States, United Kingdom, and Russia. Unfortunately, one of these countries broke its promise and invaded. So the other two who signed it treaty with us, a deal, a memorandum, when we gave up our nuclear weapons that we could have been now using for our protection, or just bullying everybody like uh, Putin does, that could have been our protection. Second, and let's be honest, the United States went into a lot of wars that had nothing to do with NATO, protecting other countries, let's say Kuwait, who was not even a member of NATO, and we had 35 countries step up for them when they were uh, annexed by in the 1990s. Well, unfortunately, Ukraine does not have so much oil. But we have to ask you people, and to, to be honest, I've seen the poll saying that 74% of Americans who know that the United States has always been standing for democracy, for people and for life, support the no-fly zone for Ukraine. Because people see what is happening, and they see that Ukrainians are fighting to death, are literally dying for democracy in the whole in the world. Because if we go down, Poland is going to be next. The Baltic countries are going to be next. One day, the NATO, the United States, will have to step in. It's just a matter of time. It was the same in World War II, when everybody was trying to negotiate Hitler. And he kept just going further and further. And it ended up that the countries had to step in the war. So the question is when? How many lives yeah. are needed for this? Can I ask you, just stepping away from the issue of the no-fly zone, which is, is going to be debated diplomatically, I think, for some, for some time, just for your picture of what's going on on the ground, how are people holding up where you are? How is everyone doing? You know, how, how well are people able to just endure all of this? People are ready to fight. The moral is very high, especially in the army, to be honest, because, first of all, we stopped the second biggest army in the world, and we managed to do it. Even though we are a big country comparing to other European countries, but we are very small comparing to Russia. And you see people going out and stopping tanks with literally barehanded with just Ukrainian flag flags in their hands. And uh, people are ready to fight. And people, of course, are tired because this they did not expect that that's the, the things that we keep watching on the TV would happen in real life in Europe in the 21st century, that we will literally have maternity hospitals, orphanages bombed and people killed. But people are not going to give up. And we do need support. We do need the arms. And you do not understand how inspired people are every time we see any sanction, new sanctions being implemented at Putin. Because for us, this is a step closer to our victory. We are very uh, inspired when we see new arms coming to the country because we know we are one step closer and we are very, very grateful for the international community to all the countries right. that are supporting us in that but the problem for us and i know you are probably tired of hearing from the president from every ukrainian who is probably here talking is the no fly zone is the only salvation for us at the moment for our children who are dying there being called nazis and the, I don't know, extreme rights, because that's what the Russians think. That's what Putin keeps telling them. We are fighting in the East with some Nazis and extreme rights to, yeah, uh, to yeah. have a free uh, Ukraine. Yeah, I, I, I hear you on that. And I, I am not tired of hearing it. I understand the argument for it. Who knows what will ultimately happen that may yet come to pass. And I, I don't think that anyone who's dealing with what the Ukrainian people are dealing with should have to be told we're tired of hearing it. I understand where you're coming from, and, and we'll see whether world governments ultimately see it Ukraine's way. For now, Ukrainian parliament member Oleksandra Ustinova, please stay safe as best you can, and thank you very much for making time for us. Thank you. Thank you. We will have more on Ukraine later this hour, plus some of today's other big stories, including President Biden's new executive order on cryptocurrencies and a major overhaul to help save the United States Postal Service. That's all just ahead. Stay close. It has been one of our most essential services during the pandemic, the U.S. Postal Service. It's delivered our packages and ballots and stimulus checks and vaccines and much, much more. And now Congress has passed a bill to give the post office some badly needed relief. The Postal Service Reform Act 
could free up around $50 billion in expenses over the next 10 years. Last year, the agency had a net loss of about $5 billion. This bill lifts budget requirements specific to the USPS, including a rule to finance health care in advance. It would also create a six-day delivery schedule up from five days. It creates an online dashboard to show delivery times, and it would require future USPS retirees to enroll in Medicare. This bill has had bipartisan support in both the House and the Senate. The Postal Service isn't, uh, isn't a partisan institution. In fact, it is an institution that's beloved by Americans, uh, providing services to them each and every day. Who doesn't love the post office delivering checks, uh, like Social Security checks, delivering our ballots if you're voting by mail, which a lot of people do in Ohio, uh, delivering your prescription drugs if you're a veteran? It's really important to people. The measure is on President Biden's desk awaiting his signature. NBC Capitol Hill reporter Julie Serkin joins us now with more. And Julie, this is one of those amazingly bipartisan things that seem to bring people together, perhaps because they were clear on what was at stake for the post office if this did not get passed. Yeah, that's exactly right, Joshua. To take you back, once Congress passed a reform act in 2006 that unintentionally put all of this financial burden on the Postal Service, which, by the way, does not take taxpayer funding. So they are basically reliant upon themselves, upon the sales uh, of stamps and other goods that they do to, to function properly, to keep the offices open. And it got so bad during the pandemic when, of course, we saw an increase in e-commerce. More people were shopping online. More packages were going around. People weren't going out as much to pick up their prescription medicine, for example. So this reliance became uh, even more heavy on the Postal Service. But the workers weren't there. The post offices themselves were closing due to the Postal Service losing so much money. It got so bad that after hearings in the House Oversight Committee, uh, the top members on that committee actually said that they weren't sure if the Postal Service would make it a couple of more months without this help, without lifting this financial burden. And you saw this big show of bipartisanship. I mean, covering the Senate, I don't remember other issues that get this much of a vote, 79 to 19, both sides of the aisle supporting that bill. And of course, now, as you mentioned, it's on President Biden's desk. There was also a lot of love for postal workers who have just been doing yeoman's work during the pandemic, especially Republican Senator Tom Tillis of North Carolina had this to say about postal workers, his appreciation for them. I want to thank all the postal employees over the past two years with all the things that they've done in the face of COVID, whether it's delivering vaccines, whether it's delivering medicines, uh, working with depleted resources and still delivering the mail. I want to thank them on behalf of all my colleagues. I think that they, uh, we owe them a debt of gratitude for doing their job. Julie, what is this going to mean for postal workers in terms of the benefits that are in this bill for them? Yeah, I spoke to two postal workers, specifically from rural America, small towns in Iowa. They've been working at the Postal Service for over a decade, Mallory and Sandy. Mallory told me, listen, we get a really bad rep, but I really care about customers. I have to do everything by myself. There's no automated process. In fact, she's doing the job of three people. Her post office that she used to work at uh, that was closer to her home actually ended up closing during the pandemic, which many other post offices around the country had to as well. Sandy, on the other hand, said, listen, in my town, there's a bar, a post office and a gas station, and that's about it. So people in that community that live uh, in isolated areas, often miles apart from their nearest neighbor, a lot of older people during the pandemic, understandably uh, afraid to socialize, not wanting to really go out. They really rely on the post office, not only in terms of getting their packages on time, but that's really a sense of community. Everybody there knows one another by name. And so all of this struggle and all this burden placed on them has meant a lot, not only for the postal workers, but also for the communities that they service. And they're hoping that this bill will just be a lifesaver. Mallory said this will be a lifeline for her and other postal workers and the ability to service their customers six days a week. I got to tell you one thing I was surprised to hear. FedEx and UPS doesn't even reach some of these rural areas. They have to rely on USPS to actually go that extra mile. And another thing this bill will do is actually afford the agency uh, to purchase a new fleet of vehicles. Some of those trucks are 30 years old. They don't even fit the size of the Amazon packages anymore. So this is a huge deal. It's one that was 15 years in the making. It took a lot of negotiating. Of course, not everyone got what they wanted, but this is surely a start, Peters told me yesterday, Senator Peters. 
Yeah, pretty remarkable to see, to remember, rather, how much the Postal Service is still the backbone of deliveries, regardless of who you actually do your deliveries through. Oh, one more thing, by the way, Julie, what's our read on the president? Oh, is he expected to sign it? Has the administration said that it supports this bill becoming law? Yeah, absolutely. He's expected to sign it soon. Obviously, the White House has other pressing matters uh, to attend to. The government funding runs out on Friday, for example. Uh, but there is definitely support, broad support, not only from Congress, from the administration. And in fact, yesterday I was in that press conference uh, where you played a bite of those senators speaking and I asked them uh, what this means and what's next. And they all said that this is also in part to the leadership at USPS. Obviously, Postmaster DeJoy was embroiled in controversy over the last few years, but all of them acknowledged uh, that this was part of his 10 year plan, that this is moving in the right direction. And so it seems like things are finally uh, gaining steam and picking up traction and the Postal Service is going to be able to soon have that infusion uh, of help by lifting this financial burden. Thank you, Julie. That's NBC's Julie Serkin with the latest on the future of the Postal Service. Much appreciated. Cryptocurrencies are reshaping the U.S. economy. But what about a digital currency from the United States? An executive order from President Biden could make that a reality. The president signed the executive order today. It supports research and development for an official American cryptocurrency. The technical term is a central bank digital currency. And the idea is for it to be equivalent to an American dollar. The executive order instructs federal agencies to explore these six aspects of cryptocurrency. Consumer and investor protection, financial stability, illicit activity, U.S. competitiveness on a global stage, financial inclusion, and responsible innovation. Now, this directive has been a long time coming. The announcement sent cryptocurrency prices surging today. Some of you who invest in crypto probably already noticed that. Well, China and the Bahamas already have their own digital currencies, and some consider the Bahamian one among the world's most successful. South Korea has a new president, a star prosecutor turned opposition leader. Today, Lee Jae-mung of the governing party conceded to his conservative rival, Yoon Suk-yul. The presidential race was tight, full of harsh rhetoric and lawsuits. South Korea has its share of political divisiveness, much like the U.S., but unlike America, its president is elected by a direct popular vote, and re-election is not an option. Winners serve a single five-year term. Today's win reinstates conservatives in the country's presidency. It also opens the door for a tougher stance on North Korea and a stronger alliance with the United States. Mr. Yoon will replace a progressive president, Moon Jae-in. His five-year term ends in May. Russia is doing without some of the world's most recognizable brands. They're shutting down operations there over this war. McDonald's, Starbucks, and hundreds more are backing away. The impacts they're having and how it affects their bottom lines before we go. Social media brings the world to us in startling ways, including from the front lines of war. Believe it or not, this makes covering wars both easier and harder. NBC News has a social news gathering team. Our team verifies and reports on social media posts and gets permission to use them in our reporting. These are just a few of the verifiable posts that we found. But not all the stories are actually getting out of Ukraine. Internet outages are becoming more common, and some towns have been offline for days. NetBlocks is a company that tracks global outages. It says that overall connectivity has dipped about 20% since the Russian invasion began. Communication issues are just one of the many obstacles for people fleeing the violence. That was the case for a professional soccer player who documented his escape from a war zone. It just happened like one day to another. Like everything was fine, and the next morning, everything went chaotic. The, this attack by Russia, which began about eight hours ago, came in from three different locations. The government has imposed a, a state of emergency, calling it martial law. Obviously, people are worried about me. How could I communicate with everyone at the same time? So I will just put it on TikTok and uh, Instagram so everyone could see what's going on. 
and between the communist world, people could help each other, people who watch me as well, and people that are having the same problem, people that were stuck there looking for a solution to get out. You're thinking, like, wow, well, this only happens in movies and all like history books, and you're right, right now I'm here, I'm experiencing it. Tanks and the explosion, I didn't see, but like, I could see the buildings and that on fire. At first, we are on our way to Poland. We had other people that left way before us, and they were telling us, it's crazy around here. Then we found other, other routes to go to like the Hungarian border, or the Romanian one, or Slovakia, or the Hungary one, or the closest one uh, from where we, where we was at that time. The gas, the gas was the main problem. Like, you only get 20 liters per car. We had to make sure we had gas, enough gas to, for the car so we could continue our journey. We had a breakdown as well, where we were waiting in the motorway for one hour and a half, and you could see the tanks going past us at night. There was nothing to eat, like there was no hot feed, because people already bought everything. All I was eating was Pringles and or chocolate. When we got to Hungary, the McDonald's were just there, like maybe like 15 minutes away. So I, I just wanted to eat something hot. <laughs> parents they're very protective my mom has high blood pressure so if i'm not home she already she's always nervous thinking is my son okay <laughs> so when i got home she really got emotional he's in one piece kept touching my face hugging me <laughs> i always talk to my teammates from ukraine and they, they're telling me like they can see from the window they can see like buildings on fire the explosions We'll wake them up sometimes and just keep praying that everything goes quick and we can actually just be like it used to be for them. An amazing journey. And it's easy to see why this war and what it does to people like him are putting more pressure on big businesses to cut their ties with Russia. Starbucks, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, they're just some of the companies shutting down their operations there. McDonald's, for example, estimates that it will lose about $50 million a month. CNBC's Shepard Smith says their exit is especially significant. It was a cultural phenomenon. McCapitalism unveiled in Pushkin Square in Soviet Russia, 1990. The largest Mickey D's in all the world. 27 registers, 900 seats, 600 workers. The buns stacked up by the thousands. The patties rolling down the Western-made assembly line. They served 30,000 meals that day, a McDonald's record. The open arms of 1990 closed and crushed by Putin's war machine. That was CNBC's Shepard Smith reporting, and so far more than 300 companies have announced some sort of suspension in Russia. They include car companies like Ford and GM, hospitality companies like Airbnb and Expedia, and media companies including Netflix and Disney. Joining us now by phone is Professor Jeffrey Sonnenfeld, Senior Associate Dean for Leadership Studies at the Yale School of Management. He compiled a list of the companies leaving and staying in Russia. Professor, welcome to the program. Oh, thanks. It's a delight to join you. What are some of the things you've heard from CEOs about why they've chosen to leave or stay? Uh, those who, who chose to leave, it was moral outrage uh, and, a, and a recognition that the ways that they can enhance the economic sanctions is with a business blockade. That's when sanctions have really worked to reinforce each other uh, with the blockade is perhaps the best example was uh, with South Africa in the late 1980s. And it was very effective for the erosion of apartheid. And uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu told me that personally when I met with him soon afterwards. Uh, and they were trying to repeat that success. When you freeze up civil society the way Gandhi did or the way it happened under Nikolai Ceausescu when he was overthrown in Romania or Eric uh, 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 Stroman in, uh, in East Germany is that uh, it, you see that the tyrant is not really a successful totalitarian. So they want to step away and know it's going to cause havoc by paralyzing the economy, but it hopefully prevents war. How much of this do you think was the moral stance that the companies took and how much of it was just practical business logistics? I mean, it is harder to do business in a part of the world that's sort of rocked by a refugee crisis and military vehicles and logistics moving across borders. I mean, what do you see as the balance of those factors? Well, I mean, good question. You have personal risk, of course, 
the, the warfare and the, the danger of the, the health, uh, of course, the safety of your workers. You also have a problem with people who were doing a business with the, uh, with the oligarchs that are now sanctioned. And then, of course, you have problems with the sanctions themselves uh, tying up uh, business so that people, you know, there's some businesses who just can't get goods in there uh, to sell them. So you're right. There's some of that. It's a practicality. Uh, but there's a big reputational stain for staying uh, that, of course, that you have blowback from all sorts of critical constituencies, uh, blowback from uh, from uh, uh, your investors. The stocks that we put up on, on, on your sister station at CNBC yesterday, uh, who these uh, companies were that were staying, the remaining companies, the stocks plummeted. It was uh, a pretty, uh, pretty awful. And uh, that there's big investor blowback, there's consumer boycotts, and of course, amazing, the revulsion of professionals, of young professionals, all the major consulting firms and accounting firms that pulled out right up front, most of those guys would rather shoot themselves than engage in global geopolitical conflict. They're usually very avoidant, but they were right on the front lines this time because of the internal voices of vocal and highly nomadic uh, mobile uh, pro professionals that said they were ashamed to be a part of a business that's propping up this, uh, this villainous, uh, murderous regime. In terms of the businesses that remain in business in Russia, at least at the moment, Hilton and Hyatt have said they will stop operating their hotels there. But they will, I'm sorry, they will continue operating their hotels there, but they will cease developing new ones in Russia. In our last minute or so, Professor, is there a business case to be made for staying in operation in Russia, at least right now, perhaps keeping everyday Russians employed during some of the economic turmoil that President Vladimir Putin has caused? No, your lead-in suggests that it's painful because there's a mindset of perestroika, of one big happy family unifying in the post-Cold World days that many of these brands, of course, like, you know, Levi's and McDonald's and some of the hotels and Pepsi and Coke and things like that, Starbucks, was, a, was a, an escape of, uh, of representing freedom. But that's a world which is gone. Right now, there's no middle ground, and a lot of these businesses are looking for a middle ground. They're used to win-win solutions. There's no win-win here. You have an evil, vicious uh, tyrant, a villain on one side, and you have innocent victims being machine-gunned and, and, and shelled in their homes and hospitals on the other. Uh, so there's no middle ground. That's, that's the hard reality here, and some of these companies have, companies have trouble adjusting to it. And some companies yeah. are afraid, as you suggest, about re-engaging with the consumer base when all this is over if they leave. But they're going to be hated if they are the companies that stay. There's, you know, that Uni Uniqlo is one of the perhaps most reviled companies today as they are right. stubbornly staying in there. Yale Management Professor Jeffrey Sonnenfeld. Professor, thank you very much. Hey, before we go, one no, more you. thing, a musical moment of defiance. Beethoven's Ode to Joy is the anthem of the European Union. Ukraine is applying to join. And that anthem made for a poignant moment in the heart of Kiev. The conductor of the Classic Symphony Orchestra called it a concert for peace. Thanks for making time for us. Tomorrow we will be speaking with Igor Novikov, a former advisor to Ukraine's President Zelensky. Do send us your questions and comments by social media, voicemail, or email. We would love to hear from you. Until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. See you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.